And so we're going to have a prayer. And so I'd just like to kind of jump in there. Um, right now, our website is down. So you have the card. If you want to contact us, feel free to contact us. Um, our phone number is on the card as well. Can you keep us healthy? Okay. It's, it's, it's our defense. It's, it's, it's a conglomeration of systems in our bodies that help us fight against illness. Right? And so there's different parts of our bodies that, that are part of the immune system. A lot of parts of our body are part of the immune system. Our skin is part of the immune system. Our tonsils, some of us don't have our tonsils, and that's a shame because that's part of the immune system. That's one of the defenses, one of our first line of defense against illness. Um, even they're speculating, and I, I kind of agree with them, that the appendix, the appendix is part of the immune system as well. You know, there's more research now that's coming out with that. What, so, what the is appendix. It? Oh, the appendix? Yes. And they're coming out with more research on that topic, and um, so we're just learning and expanding our understanding of the immune system. And so the idea is to strengthen our immune system, to keep things out. But we have to give our immune system a fighting chance, don't you agree? We have to cooperate in this. And so there's a lot of things out there. Um, one thing now that's coming out is this. Anybody know what this is? Oh, Zika. Zika. Now mosquitoes. Yes. People are afraid. Now, it's always been the case. Um, Puerto Rico, though, has been hit hard with that, with Zika, and so they're, they're finding more cases there. That's uh, one of the places that it's been hard. But now, you know, the idea is that there are things out there to hurt us. Isn't that true? Yes. Okay? And um, the thing is, we have to try not to hurt ourselves in the process and try to, to, to do things also, and I have to say this, to try to do things in a balanced way. That's also important. Because sometimes we, in, in our hopes to do better, sometimes we go maybe too far. Too far. Now the, the question is, what's overboard? <laughs> you know what I mean? Can we leave this middle light on, please? You want the middle light Yeah, on? I want the middle light on. For now. We're good for now. There you go. There we go. The middle one. OK. So, so this way people want to ride and stuff, and I can see folks. <laughs> We want to maintain a balance, and that's the, that's sometimes a challenge. What is the balance, and what is not, and where do we need to really kind of get on board and, and, and be strict, and where we maybe don't need to be. And so it is important to find a balance. But there are many things out there that we need to be careful against. And that's what our body tries to do. There's a war going on inside of us. As we even sit here, and while people are gathering their food, we are fighting. Our bodies are fighting. They always are. And so it depends how well we arm our body, you see? You know? And that all depends on how we're eating, right? How we're sleeping, um, the stress in our lives. Are we getting the right amount of water? And nowadays, hopefully, getting filtered water, which will be even more helpful. There's things that we can do to help ourselves. So we're going to be talking about a few, a little bit more about that. Now, this is amazing. These are two cells attacking the tumor cell. And that's what our body is doing right now. Okay, these are two T cells attacking a tumor cell. This is a, a neutrophil. Excuse me a second. <coughs> <coughs>
attacking and growth of bacteria. And this is another type of white blood cell. <clears throat> it's extending its pseudopod, its, its arm, and to help devour all invaders in the body. So our body's always fighting, or at least trying to. Now, <clears throat> what happens when the immune system goes wrong? When you sick. But there's specific names for that as well. They're called autoimmune diseases. Oh. oh, really? Yes. I've been studying up on that. Have you really? Because of the Yes. They thought I had it, but I just had a blue test and I don't have it. But I've got a virus in the time. So I, I, didn't, oh. I didn't even know what an autoimmune disease was until I started doing research. Yeah. It's kind of your body. What happens is your body recognizes other proteins that look similar to the disease or to a protein that potentially can harm you, and so it attacks it as well, thinking, I'm going to kill that, and I'm going to kill all the ones in my body that look like it, too. And those necessarily are harmful. This is a kneecap here, and this kneecap has been riddled. This person is having, um, actually, this back is someone with rheumatoid arthritis, or a type of arthritis. And so, even our immune system sometimes would, would hurt, hurt us, mm -hmm. trying to save us. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to talk about something that I think is one of the worst things that we can do to our bodies, and that is sugar. Okay? Why do you think sugar is not healthy? Mm -hmm. I don't know, but they just say they do for you. Okay. Well, I've heard the cancer feeds on it. Yeah, I've heard that too. Oh, okay. So, so that means some, some kind of blood cells or something's multiplying. Yeah, right? Yeah. The thing with sugar, and I can't, I, I have never read that, but it's very possible that that's the case. But the one thing about sugar is that sugar depletes the body nutrients. So we think we're eating. Say someone eats a bowl of Frosted Flakes in the morning mm -hmm. with a banana, right? Oh, yes. pretty healthy, right? Flakes, banana. Thing is, though, it's riddled with sugar. Yeah. Mm. And so anything we put in our body, we just negated that, and then some. Wow. Okay. And I think I give this illustration of Bill in this class, and some of you all, and it's worth saying again because it's so which is really shares what sugar does to the body. <clears throat> and just Grace, with Joan and Grace, let's say I go to your homes and you invite me there. And I come and I make myself at home. And you're more gracious and you're very really gracious to let me do that. But I use up the food, I don't clean up after myself, I take your car, leave it somewhere, come back, so I don't know where it is. How long are you going to keep me there? <laughs> hey, you're gracious, but you know what? <laughs> I know she smiles like, I want to keep you there, but that's what sugar does. It takes everything from us. Okay? Yeah, it's a, it actually, originally, it was either beets or cane, usually where white sugar comes from. I'm not talking about the artificial sweeteners. I'm just talking about plain sugar, table sugar. And, uh, but it doesn't look like beets anymore. Does it look like cane? Sugar, or cane, from the cane sweetener? No, not anymore, because it's been so refined. Mm -hmm. And so, this is kind of a funny thing I found. One serving provides you with your minimum yearly requirement. <laughs> One serving will provide, it is almost true, if you want. Yeah. Okay. The average, the average American consumes an outstanding two to three pounds of sugar each week. <coughs> each week. And we're not talking about children, children consuming more on the average. I must not be average, but I use five pounds in years. Well, that's good. That's a good thing. In the last 20 years, 26 pounds to 135 pounds per person per year. During the turn of the century, people use about five pounds per year. It wasn't as easy to get. And um, people just didn't use it that, that regularly. It was a treat. 
unfortunately now our treats are happening too often, and when they do happen, we're eating more of them. And during that time, cardiovascular disease and cancer was virtually unknown. Okay? Now, what happens is when we consume sugar, the refined, the refined product, sugar raises insulin levels. Insulin level then inhibits the growth of certain hormones, and that depresses the immune system. Okay? So eating a donut can depress your immune system, which means it could cause it not to have the same potential our ability to fight illness that we all need. Don't you agree? We saw that list in the beginning, and that was just a short list that I showed you. We can afford to hinder ourselves. Um, not only that, the, the act of raising the insulin in the body contributes to diabetes as well. Let's look at this here. Um, estimated teaspoon of sugar per serving. In a cola beverage or some sort of beverage, Sprite, whatever it may be, you have at least, um, in a 12 ounce can, at least 10 teaspoons of sugar. Okay? One can of soda can deplete, and it can be juices, because now juices have sweeteners in it as well, can deplete your immune system by 50%. 50%. So if I have a soda, let's say, right, and usually people don't nurse the soda for hours. You say 15 and 15. Five, zero. Feet and half. Okay? And people don't usually drink that soda and say, okay, I'm just going to drink this over the next few hours. They just, you know, they just drink it down. Usually it's a thirst quencher, right? Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> maybe a few hours later, do what? Have some more. Mm -hmm. So the immune system's ability to fight has been compromised. And we can't afford that. And there's something simple we can do. Eliminate products that have refined sugars. Now also one thing I want to uh, share with you is that a refined product is the same thing as having white sugar. Okay? Because that's how it's converted into the body. The body is using that as pure energy. Fiber, when we have fiber foods, not been refined, the body releases it slowly, like a time release capsule, right? Mm -hmm. When it's refined, white flour, white rice, so forth and so on, it goes into the system right away. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now maybe if we were a marathon runner, the body can deal with it a little better. Because guess what? You're burning it off. Mm -hmm. But even if you were, it's still part of the system. Why? What did I say in the beginning? It depletes the body of nutrients. Because to be processed, it needs to take. It's been refined. Things have been taken out. So the body says, oh, okay, I'll process this, but I can't until I get some calcium. I get a little zinc from the body. Or I get something else from the body, so it depletes the body. Have to look at some of the other things like apple pie, ice cream, and yogurt, and various other things. The truth is, <clears throat> processed foods are so incredibly rewarding to our brains that they affect our thoughts and behavior, making us eat more and more until eventually we become what? Okay. Foods that are engineered to be what we call hyper-rewarding, effectively short-circuiting our innate breaks against consumption are not good. Because what's happening is it's affecting our brain. Because remember, what's happening here is not... It, it, somehow what we put in here is going to affect this, right? Don't you agree? Right? Mm -hmm. Just because it's going down this way, <laughs> it doesn't be fixed, fills us out to the entire body. And our whole body is a chemical process. I'm going to just a second here. It's a chemical process. So it's going to other parts of the body. And so it's affecting, these foods are affecting the way we think about food and the way we consume food. Because they're addictive, that's one thing. And the way they excite the brain as well. Go ahead, did you have a question? You have a comment? A brain freeze shows exactly how fast 
what we put in our mouth can affect the rest of our body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Overweight and obesity, let's just talk a little bit about that. They had experiments with uh, lab mice. Um, you had mice with normal weight, and you had mice that were overweight. 4% of the lean mice died, and 40% of the extra fat ones had diminished ability to fight the virus. The obese mice were 10 times more likely to die from the flu than the lean mice. Okay? Extra adipose tissue is a hormone. That hormone affects the body. That hormone makes the immune system less effective. So that's one thing to, to always consider. And going by what they did was going by their body fat percentage. The lean mice that were about 21% body fat versus the overweight mice that were 31%. And it made their um, natural killer cells 50% uh, or 50% reduction in their ability to fight infection or to fight disease. Okay? Being depressed reduces our ability to fight illness. Okay? Um, but sometimes it's hard not to be depressed, right? <laughs> sometimes you're weighed down by certain things. Right? I have a friend of mine here, Christine, that every once in a while we, we talk on the phone. And Christine, what do I tell you sometimes? Remember the song we sing? No worries. Be happy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Remember that song? Da, 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 da. Yeah. Don't worry. Be happy. Yeah, right? like so <laughs> even that song made it better laugh, right? <laughs> so think for a moment, that help to create, you know, that help to bolster our immune system. We're all going to go through issues, okay? Yeah. Where the things we brought on ourselves because we weren't too wise, mm -hmm. or because we didn't have enough information in our lives. A lot of times it happens when we're young. Or, <clears throat> um, it's because we're living in the world we're living in. That's another aspect of it. No one goes through this life uh, without, you know, Trials. Trials or meeting up with some thorns in their life, okay? Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. It's called LIFE. Huh? It's called LIFE. 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 <laughs> but the thing is, is we can make decisions, and this is something we talked about when I used to, I haven't taught a depression seminar or a stress management seminar in a while, but this is one thing we can control because we can control the way we handle something, mm -hmm. or we can choose to say, I know this is horrible, but I'm going to be happy anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay? No one can take that away from me to be happy. And I have to remind myself that all the time. I go, okay, I'm not going to anybody to take away my joy. You know, I'm going to know there are times when my joy is taken away. I go, oh, I got to get it back. <laughs> because that helps us not to fall into depression. And, that, uh, and, and I, like, I use the Bible every once in a while because I like some of the references the Bible has. I think they're very practical. And it says that a merry heart is good like a medicine. But a broken spirit drives the bone. And that they are finding now scientific research which shows that individuals that are depressed, mm -hmm. sick, because depression goes along with you know, sickness and illness, they kind of go hand in hand, that individuals like that oftentimes suffer from osteoporosis. That's true. Okay? Mm -hmm. So now we look at the Bible more as a, as a scientific book than just, you know, um, I should say just a spiritual book, but it has a greater dimension. All right? And so chronic inflammation and depression go hand in hand. We don't want inflammation in the body. And people say, well, I don't have a cut or a sore, so I don't have any inflammation. Oh, yes, you can. You can't see it, but yes, you can have an inflammation in the body. Okay. Now, they did a study with um, individuals that were caregivers, uh, and I know Maybe some of you have gone through that experience, or not your mom, or you got or dad, and you got have children you have to watch out for. It said to the adults in the study, they were caregivers, and they had symptoms of depression versus those that were not caregivers. Their blood tests showed an inflammation rate 30% higher than the non-depressed individuals. Yes. So one of the ways of, way of measuring inflammation is by looking at the sedimentation rate. Yes. 
C-reactive so protein is the most accurate. Mm -hmm. yes. So what would the, in terms of sedimentation rate, what would be, what, what is normal and what's 30% high and things like that? That's a good question. You would have to have, okay, different labs many times, their values run different. So they have their standard. You have many labs that are the same, but different labs are different. So let's say whatever norm would be, let's say, let's say a sedimentation rate, and I, right now uh, a number is escaping me, but let's just say for argument that 70 would be normal. Okay? Or 70 would be a good rate. Okay? Um, theirs was 30% higher than that. Mm -hmm. You see? So whatever the norm would be, okay, 30%. add 30% to that, okay? Uh, which you don't want, but that was a really good question, though. Uh, I just had my just had blood work done. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, that's why it was on your mind first. I just had my blood work done not long ago, and, and um, mm -hmm. what I don't understand, uh, it, the range on C-reactive protein, that's mm -hmm. supposed to indicate how much inflammation you got in your body. Mm -hmm. It was a range from like, 0 to 8. Right. Uh, and mine was 0. 0.6, it wasn't even my whole point. But last year, before I started having some problems with this knee, it was 0. 0.1. So how can it be so low with this information? information well, you always have to remember the tests. First of all, they can give... Labs don't share this all the time, but they can give false results. So that's why sometimes you have to do, I'll get you just a second, I mean, you have to maybe do another test, mm -hmm. okay? And the thing is sometimes, uh, yeah, well, like pay for that. Yeah, but like two years in a row, it would have been, uh -huh. you know. Okay. Yeah, but that one test, if you would have tested a month later, or two weeks later, mm -hmm. might have shown what the one a year later showed, because sometimes you have what they call false positives. Yes, Amy? I was going to say also, I know Speak before up. researching the lab, blood work that you and I were putting out, they were saying that a lot of values in the range, in the higher range, are just looking for an average. So some people can still look like they're normal blood work, but their value for their body is still too low for them to actually be carrying the problem. Okay. That's Not a good showing point. up. Not good, but what happens when they do values, they do an average. You have to look at the entire population, let me say the United States to have values, right? We're not looking at the world, because that would be, and they do that, the World Health Organization does that. So it, it has a certain standard as well. But they have to look at values for the entire United States. What they do is they pick a range. That's what they got done. You see, they pick a range. But that doesn't mean that if you were a little lower, that you're still not, you're not in a good range, or a little bit higher from their values. It just depends. It just depends. Um, a good way to know, it's kind of challenging sometimes, a good way to know is to take multiple tests if you can, insurance, or if something, another, to me, is just to try to do what I can do, to try to help reduce and keep myself healthier. That's what I'm doing. Because after a while, I mean, tests are great, you get me wrong, the doctor's good, getting, getting diagnosis is wonderful, but at some point, you can't do all the tests. You know what I mean? You can't, so, but at some point you have to say, okay, I need to then maybe get some more exercise, okay, within moderation, with the more my body can manage and it'll build up, I gotta drink my more water, I gotta get, you know, so starting to put our life more into line to see how those things can improve well, I, I, automatic, I automatically without even getting yeah, the blood test. Now, after your doctor, I'm depending on him to tell me what to do, and I'm trying my best to do exactly what he says. What he says, well, that's, that's okay. That's good. I'm not saying that's not a good thing. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that at some point, then we start learning and we start saying, well, maybe I can do a little this or I can do a little that. And so when you've gotten the arthritis, another thing I have to remember as we get older, there's, it was only one thing. Is, that, is it a rheumatoid arthritis? Well, no, they said it, I had it's a rheumatoid arthritis test and they said it was not rheumatoid arthritis. I was going to say. It was a virus that could turn me into. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, okay, so it's a virus that potentially, because usually if you only have pain in one joint, it's not RA. Uh, it's well, always, it's always going to be in the, 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 the other joint, whether it's to both knees, both elbows, both shoulders, so forth and so on. It's oh, always okay. going to, yes, yes. So another thing about getting sick. Uh, well, you know, it, it's a good idea to, to do the best we can, but there gets to a point where we are aging. 
there is the thing about aging. It's a process that we all will go through and eventually, you know, when that will be. <coughs> how well, though, we can live out that life depends on how well we take care of it. That's it. You know, we can be somebody that's bedridden versus someone who's the active and, and able to function. I think that's the... I don't think we can stay perfectly healthy in that we always, we all, we are going to get older at some point and we're going to have some more problems. I don't know if that helps to answer that. What I'm trying to, what I'm trying to get at is that you have to do the best you can. Get as much information as you can. And when you have these tests, ask questions. That's the other thing. Ask questions from your doctor. Your doctor doesn't want to answer questions. There's something wrong. Oh, I don't even listen to my medical doctor. I just go get my blood work done. I go to my natural doctor. There you go. I don't have no answers. No, okay. No. All right. So this is what they find about depression. So being depressed is, is something to try to avoid. Depression was associated with greater tobacco, caffeine consumption, less physical activity, and poor sleep quality. Because when you're depressed, you don't feel like doing anything. And, and, your, and your judgment is not as good. So whether it, it might not be caffeine or tobacco for some individuals, but it may be something else that they may indulge that's not healthy for them. And remember, the way we think affects our health. Okay? The way we are processing here, yes, it's going to affect my liver. It's going to affect my pancreas. It's going to affect my other organs. They have to live in this body, right? So it's going to affect her. You know? I read somewhere once where it says that when one organ is affected, another synthesizes. And we're seeing that now in, uh, in, in medical journals, that other parts of the body try to compensate. Okay? So, I, I like the idea that we can have control over whether or not I'm sad or happy. Okay? And sometimes you just have to, I don't know, if I get a little, you know, off or whatever, you know, I just could tell someone to talk to, but if not, going outside, doing some gardening, distracting yourself, you know, helping someone else is going to be the best way to help you if you're depressed. <laughs> Because it just, it makes you feel better, you know. Okay, depression reduces lymphocyte reproductive response, which is another type of uh, uh, cell that helps to fight um, illness in our body. The stronger the reproductive response, the better the system is working. A reduced response, immune system to live to fight. It's going to get compromised. Okay, you are what you eat. Now we're going to use more faster. Diets, they have found diets high in animal protein, saturated fat, <coughs> egg, and dairy products increase the risk of lymphatic cancer. Diets high in plant fiber like broccoli and lettuce and tomatoes and other vegetables result in a 40% increase in the risk of lymphatic cancer. And I'm going to share one thing with you. I know that our products are getting, even the healthier products, right, plant-based products, are also um, I guess for lack of a better word, being tampered with. But you always have to remember, okay? Well, first of all, if you can get things that are organic, great. But we can't always afford that. If you can grow them, even if you started to grow a few tomato plants in your home, that's something that you can do already. And you can have it in your home. And you don't have to, it doesn't have to be fancy. I remember living in an apartment, having a balcony, finding some old wooden crates that someone discarded, um, went to a friend's house, had his truck, put a bunch of dirt back there, and I had six tomato plants on my balcony. And me and the neighborhood liked it, because I had people stealing my tomato plants. <laughs> my tomatoes, my tomatoes, on the out. And I was like, but they were good. They were good. So little things like that to help us. But also remember that even the foods that have been tampered still, to a certain degree, have the phytochemicals, or to a greater degree, I should say, than the meat and the dairy product. Phytochemicals, antioxidants, they still have that in them. Mm -hmm. So it helps, they, they are able to help offset a lot of stuff as well. Just keep that in mind. <clears throat> but I agree, we may get to a point where if we can grow, we would be better off. No, but even if we start small, we're doing better. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has linked contaminated poultry to an estimated 4 billion salmonella cases and helicobacter pylori infections that occur annually. 
We don't hear about this. But a little broccoli has a problem, and it's all the news. <laughs> but we don't hear of how, because we also have to remember that there are agendas and, uh, you know, um, companies pay to keep things secret. Company, I mean, it makes sense, right? If I want to make money, I don't want this information out there. So I'm going to make sure it does it. I'm going to, you know, try to, you know, but it's out there. You know, you call the U.S. Department of Agriculture, uh, the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, the statistics are all there. What about fish? Supervising the growth of fish is nearly impossible. And due to the its free movement across the waters, fish consume much toxic waste, which are polluted materials discharged into their habitat. And they appear in inland waterways, rivers, and polluted lakes. And some of these are industrial waste, sewage, pesticides, insecticides, PCB and DDT, dioxin, methyl mercury, lead, and that's just a, part, a very small list. Okay? So, should we eat fish? What about the omega 3s? Why don't we try eating a black seed? Mm -hmm. okay. Dairy products? Milk contains more than 25 different proteins that can induce adverse reactions in humans. Just plain milk. I'm not talking about how to do process, I'm not talking about the contamination it may have, I'm just talking about milk itself. You know, they are attributing that some diabetics, okay, um, especially the type 1 diabetics, they are thinking it may be an autoimmune disease now. All right? And they, yes, you have, and they're tying it back to perhaps the way they were fed when they were young. Uh, this is uh, two quotes from two different doctors, Dr. Agatha Thrash, and this is uh, Frederick Spear. Uh, milk may produce any allergic <coughs> system known. Milk is almost always a fact of serious otitis media and infection of the middle ear. You know, nowadays, I know when I was growing up, it was a tonsil thing, right? And so they would line you up, and I remember when they pulled out my tonsils, which I'm not happy about. I haven't been since I found out all this information, you know? Anyway, but what can you do about that now? I can't throw them back, unfortunately. But the thing is, is that they were tying you up, and you know, after my parents struggled with me, or them constantly getting inflamed and me constantly getting sick, they, they said, yes, just take them out. They would line up a bunch of us, and they're marching you through, and you know, like a little factory production. Take them all out. Now it's putting tubes in ears. Infection. Okay? Infection, because, and if they, if my parents had just taken away the dairy, they didn't know. And if, now they're showing experiments that mm -hmm. children that are taken off milk for anywhere from three months to four months, it clears up. Well, am I in the right sense? Okay. Yeah. He was, um, I think he was, he was on milk, on child's milk, and he had had three or four serious infections, and the inner ear was filled with <coughs> liquid. And we were about to take him, he was about one year old, to the ENT to get the tubes, the tubes in. in. Yeah. And I was I was like praying and praying, I'm like, God, you gotta show me the truth here. And I was praying and praying and praying. And that weekend my dad called after seeing the coronary health improvement program in Wichita. Mm -hmm. And he said, Your son has an allergy to dairy products. If you don't take them off of that, it won't get better. And, and I took even with the tubes. You're right. Well, I never took them to get the tubes done. Uh -huh. No, but after three weeks off of dairy, I bought them soy milk. Mm -hmm. It cleared up, and I never came back again until the grandma started giving them dairy. Giving them, yeah. giving them dairy again, well, without my consent. Well, it's such a that's unfortunate, but it's such a simple thing. But the thing is, it's scary. It's scary and not especially if you're raising children, right? What do you give your kids? Milk is like the thing to give them, right? They're supposed to grow up. I remember growing up and <coughs> drinking, you know, a glass of milk with my meal every day, maybe two or three times a day, all right? Um, but there are other things to give them that have the nutrients. Now, ideally, breast milk would be the thing, right? Number one. 
But sometimes there are challenges with that. Either the child won't take the milk, or the mother can't produce as much milk, or you know, there may be other other reasons. Or the mother didn't go to the leche and figure out how to nurse. Or maybe not how to nurse, which whichever the case may be. Um, the fact is that there's other things that could be given. There are other, um, and I know some people are afraid of soy milk now, and that's another thing. Well, hopefully, maybe we can touch on. But there are other um, almond milks, other seeds, grains that, that you can utilize. And I've seen, I've seen this from when I was working in tree farms. I was there for 16 years. Children being raised on these diets and doing better and thriving actually. Yes, Amy. I would say the big thing there at one point was. If you don't get your milk, you're going to have brittle bones. I was raised dairy free, and that's always what they said. You're going to break your bones. You're going to break your bones. How do you not have dairy in your diet? I broke one bone from a hard fall, but never broke anything else from just minor accidents. But that's the big thing, too, which makes parents worry about you. Yeah, then you're going to not even have porous bones or early osteoporosis. Or that. Oh, no. What causes osteoporosis? Yeah, because it yeah. depletes the body of calcium. Yeah. And what helps not to get osteoporosis is the biggest thing, besides getting the is exercise. Uh, when I started studying about respiratory arthritis, mm -hmm. the world just sick of One of the things I read was this eight year old girl, little girl, and she had rheumatoid arthritis and her joints were swollen and inflamed. I mean, real bad. And she got where she couldn't even, she was in and out of the hospital constantly, and she couldn't even hardly move, you know. She just got down and, you know. And they took her off dairy, and within two weeks' time, the swelling and all that stuff went down, and, and she got all right. In two weeks, it didn't change anything but dairy. And so, we have to look at the fact that certain proteins we're not we were meant ever to consume. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about gluten, but I'm going to back up here. You ever think about the fact that uh, a cat increases or doubles its birth weight within seven days? I think a cow increases its birth weight within what, 45 days, or 50 days, something like that. A child, a human, takes much more long, much longer to do that, to double the birth weight. But meanwhile, many times we're giving what a cow needs a cow, to a baby. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what I'm getting at? Okay? That's not what that, the, the cow, well, that little cat has to get a whole lot bigger. And the muscles are going to be quite different. You see what I mean? And so now we're giving this to a child who doesn't have that need. Okay. Not the child will look like a cow, we can tell them. Well, it's not looking like a cow necessarily, but the thing is, is that then you're having uh, early development because of certain proteins. Because I know not only the contamination, but protein itself accelerates aging. I'm going to give you an example. I have a log, a wood log, right? And I take that same wood log, uh, or I cut another one the same size, same circumference, and shredder, let's say, with a shredder. So now I have shredded wood, same amount of wood, right? Which one, if I put in a fire, is going to burn faster? The okay, same amount of wood, though, okay, is the way it's processed. It's in the form it's in. in the way, and, and, and in the case of certain proteins, the way the body is going to process those proteins. So, milk, proteins, and proteins from animal, animal proteins overall will accelerate, accelerate aging. Okay. and cause a maturity in younger people at earlier ages, and then to boot what they're doing to the foods as well, the dairy, especially the dairy and the meat, things like that, it accelerates their, their development. How do they do to the free radicals? Well, that's, yeah, that's a, that's, that continues the story. <laughs> Talk about moving a little bit here. Everybody's seen these things, 100% uh, gluten-free, and when I want to discuss about this, I don't mind when, because we see this happen many times, where, okay, now, everybody should get off the gluten. And no one should be eating gluten. And that's not the case. There was nothing wrong with gluten. People were eating grain uh, and not having problems. Now all of a sudden we've seen this, so we have to say logically what has happened with the processing. Now it's interesting, because Amy has celiac, and when we were in Puerto Rico, 
She was eating wheat. No problems. There. We're getting it from um, the, the wheat. It was from some local <coughs> folks. And it was not processed the same way. It wasn't contaminated. Local and she was bread. doing uh, local bread small The local bakery. bread, yeah. Small bakery. Mm -hmm. And so she was, was just going to town. Imagine you can't eat bread all of a sudden. You can't be like, oh, Lord. So she was just going to town. When she came back, within months, she was having problems. Weeks. <coughs> yeah, uh -huh. Weeks. I weeks, okay. Right. About a month Thank you for correcting me. For weeks, she was already having problems again. We have to start looking at what's happening. Now, number one, what's happening with the processing of food, number, that's number one. Number two is what's happening with each generation that it seems to be getting weaker and weaker. And actually, there's a biblical aspect, again, which I feel scientific, that talks about each generation getting a little weaker. Because think about it. Whatever, let's say we have several generations. We have generation one, generation two, generation three, Generation four, okay. Let's go back to generation one. Um, let's let's call this my maybe great grandparents. Probably worked outside more. They farmed more. They had a very different lifestyle. Maybe they ate some meat, but not as often, you know. Um, and so then, so they, but they ate some. So then they, the next generation, they produce kids, right? Next generation, right? Um, maybe they're. Lifestyle changes, they got to go to the city to work, you see what I mean? Become more sedentary in their lifestyle, then the environmental factors are involved. So guess what? Their next generation, is it going to be as strong as the first generation? No. No. Because it's depleted, right? And then this generation now is exposed to the internet and all those wonderful things perhaps that we don't know yet how that's going to affect us, right? And so now we're exposed to that, and then the environment, you know, has not gotten better in many cases. And so then the next generation. So we're seeing a depletion in how people, maybe this generation, if they had been introduced to a modified wheat or GMO wheat, might not have had a problem with it. But now this generation is just not coping the same way. Okay. Okay. So. What do you do? What's the solution here? The solution is to be aware, number one. Number two is to maybe start using more what we call the ancient brain. What happened? Well, first of all, let me back up. Um, basically, what's happening, happening is we have um, basically celiac more so, but it's uh, the microvilla, which is along the small intestinal wall. When the villi get damaged, nutrients cannot be absorbed properly into the body. So uh, that protein, that gluten, seems to damage uh, that uh, uh, those villi in the intestines. So but there's a little difference between celiac, gluten intolerance, and wheat allergies. There's a difference. Well, it actually it actually mows down all the cereal. Yeah, it eliminates it. Yeah, literally. It's like exactly like mowing, taking a mower and mowing, 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 mowing the grass down. That's what it does exactly. to the cilia. That's needful to help absorb nutrients. Right. Exactly. And so we have well, we have some differences because you hear all these words and. Celiac disease and gluten sensitivities and wheat allergy and so forth. Basically, a celiac disease is an autoimmune condition when gluten triggers. Okay? Number two, gluten intolerance, a lack of an enzyme for the gluten digestion. So it's similar to people who are sensitive to what? That certain protein in milk? Can you help me out? Huh? Lactose intolerance. You have people that are lactose intolerance that can't drink milk because they can't digest that enzyme. So you have a similar thing happening with gluten intolerance. Okay? It also is how the body's responding, and that's how they classify it. Wheat allergy is a sensitive immune system <coughs> and environmental stress. A person can be fine, but if they have other stressors, then it will trigger uh, that immune response. Okay? So there are little differences between them, but ultimately, when you get down to it, Everybody needs to be off of gluten. <laughs> That's the only way that you can get it fixed. People with celiac depending, some people with the gluten intolerance haven't had the damage, and so they can recover. Some people with celiac may be able to recover. Some of them will not be able to. It depends on the extent of the damage. It depends on how early they got it, you know, how early they were diagnosed with this, or if the parents were more aware. 
of, of this condition and kind of kept them away from those foods. Okay? Um, not eating modern wheat. Okay? Trying to find wheats that are not, that we call some of the ancient grains, and they have them available now. And they're not that totally expensive. And I don't know, I Chuck, when you order some of these, when you're working with the co-op people, don't they have some other type of ancient grains, ancient wheats, and things like that? Spelt. Spelt is one of your ancient ones. Yeah, okay. But I, I think, you would have to find out how it's been processed to see, but I don't think that's not the one I'm thinking of, though. Mean, it's not a very common one. Are you talking about the Einkorn wheat that the other lady was talking about? Say that again? Einkorn, I think is what you called it. Say it again, louder. I think it's called Einkorn. Einkorn. I'm not sure. I think, yeah. I think that's what Darlene keeps telling us. Yeah. Well. They have different names for it, that's the thing. And so, we're trying to see, just, just look it up online. I did not, I, I'm just learning about this myself, so. Um, we're trying to find <coughs> wheat that hasn't been tampered with. Okay, and they have growers that have done that. It's kind of hard because now these modified um, seeds get everywhere. You know what I mean? Because seeds germinate and they float around and they get in other places, people's gardens. It's kind of challenging, but they do have some places where it's not, you know, they're not, um, they're not been tampered with. So finally, I think we have to make that extra effort to try to find these grains. I haven't found a good source yet, but like I said, I'm just learning more about this myself. So check out my website down the line, and I'm going to try to have more information about these things. Now, what about oats? Some people can't have it. They're celiac. Some people can't. They're finding that most people can have it who are celiac. Some people have a sensitivity. Again, now we're finding that maybe oats, what's happening with oats is some people are getting sensitivity. but. The problem is that much of this oats are being processed in factories that carry wheat. Okay, and then when you see, they say this, the gluten has been taken out. Actually, it's not a gluten. It is I think what was it called? Avenine? And you help me out with that. It says a venin, but I think the whole word is evanastomite. Evanastomite, yeah. right? That's the similar proteins that we find in oats, and. Uh, but, like I said, so it's not exactly gluten. It does similar things to gluten. It's a similar protein. And so some people may have sensitivities or some celiacs may not be able to manage it. Because we're still learning about these illnesses and these, these sensitivities. And, but a lot of the problem is that they're being processed with meat. So that doesn't help with okay. And you cannot take this, this people say this is it's gluten free or they've taken out totally taking out this protein, um, and you can't. You can't. It's like decaffeinated coffee or sodas. You can never take all the caffeine out. You're always going to have traces. And so if someone yeah. has an illness or has a sensitivity, they might be, have to be careful with this as well. Okay, so, so that's the issue with oats. Again, trying to find places. And we, that's something we need to do more, finding places where we can have real resources. Okay? And I'm going to skip this for time's sake because I want to and stress. Stress alone can create any illness in the book. Mm -hmm. All right? Huh? When I say increase, increases any illness. Stress alone, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, whatever it may be, stress alone because of the chemical uh, atmosphere created in our body. And one of those chemicals is added cortisol that we don't need. But vitamin C actually helps to kind of bring that down and also managing our stress. Okay, so we're looking at here. These are the things, and they seem so basic, but they're so important. And I don't know why. I, I always constantly get telling him, you know, okay, we're scheduling ourselves, we need to do this, and we, and we go towards that, right? And, it, you know, and, but there's always something that tries to throw a rock at that schedule or tries to interfere with that. And, we're, and we always strive to maintain these things that are really not always that hard to do. You know, going for a walk, we take care of the exercise and the sunshine. We do it outside. Water, not so bad, right? We can get water, air. Well, when we go get the exercise and sunshine, you get some air. Um, and then managing our stress, actually the exercise alone would help with that. 
but the others and then getting rest, of course, making sure we're getting them out of sleep. These are things that seem so simple, but they carry such an impact and the depths. Of the, you know you see something that's a flower and looks so beautiful, right? And looks so simple. But the makeup of that flower and how it grew and the way the petals came out, there's a depth unknown to us, right? And this is the way these things are. There's a depth that unless we're really taking hold of them and following them, it kind of, it kind of, it loses itself. It just wilts away. Okay? Nutrition. It has been estimated that a healthy diet would prevent approximately 30% of all cancers. Exercise. You know your lymph nodes? The only way you can move lymph, and lymph is a byproduct in our body of toxins. The only way you can move lymph is by exercising. It's not like our circulation or our circulatory system. The only way we can move that lymphatic system is by exercising. So that's another thing you always have to keep in mind. That's a waste product for our body. You know, those lymph nodes, you compress in certain areas, and your neck along, um, uh, along your cervical area here, and inguinal, in your legs, other parts of your body. Those help to take care of toxins. And the only way those are rid of those toxins is Exercise. It's interesting here, the fountain of youth is possible for men over 70 to announce a new response similar to that produced by much younger men. They had age-related decline in antibody response, age-related decline in the memory T response, the older physically active subjects improved antibody and T cell response, the older sedentary subjects didn't, and this response was equal to the younger subjects. So Within the body, it could be young again, or the response could be young, and that's what we want, basically. <coughs> Wait, yeah, can, I, can you back up for a minute? Sure. I'm an old person, I'm 77. What I got to do here, what's that telling me? To do? To be young and tough? Well, it's telling you that your immune system, even if you're in your 70s, your immune system can be like it was in its 20s or 30s. Your immune system? Your immune system, yes. Okay, now what I got to do is time my Well, all these things were saying. All these things, but this okay. experiment was talking about uh, more so exercise, but all these things working together is going to help that. Right. Okay. You see what I mean? I okay. thought I was missing something. No, no, no. no. Got it. You got it. You got it. Internally, which also affects us externally, you know, the way how energetic we are. I'm going to skip through this. Okay. Time. Sunshine alone helps to increase white blood cells in the body. So, this is a, a study done with factory workers. And what they did is they put full spectrum ultraviolet light, it was a, a type of light that we get from the sun. And they put that in these factories and they found that these lights help to cut back bacteria and contamination by 40 to 70 percent and cold by 50%. Mind you, this is an artificial light that was similar to a light we get to the sun. What's it called? Huh? Ultraviolet light. But what you do is, you're better off getting into the sunshine though. It'd be better if you just get in the sunshine. But they have what we call ultraviolet lights to get some of the similar rays. But I always think it's better just to get it from the sun. And the thing is with the sun, it's true that part of the atmosphere has been affected, so we have to be careful. But you know what? 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, every day, while we go for a walk, you know, on our arms, a little bit on our face, that's all we basically need. Can we buy a light bulb in that office? You can, you can, but ultimately getting outside is going to be your better bet. Is that what the LEDs are? Uh, no. No? No, yeah, roll lights. Yeah, those are roll lights. It's called roll lights, full spectrum roll lights. Oh, okay. Yeah. Roll lights, I know. It costs a little bit more than they have. But be, but be careful, because like I said, they installed this and it wasn't close to the individuals. And this is just the light that we're getting in the atmosphere. Don't get, don't, don't, pack, well, I guess it's too hot. You can't be that close to them anyway. And so, so like I said, the best thing is if you can get outside. Because there's other things that that light cannot give you. Like the reduction, the getting more vitamin D, reducing your cholesterol. Just to name two things that sunshine can do that, um, that light won't do. But it's just showing us what it can do. Water. One simple way to protect your, your immune system is with an ionizer or an air purifier as well. Water. 
Well, you know, we know what is good. It's what we could use to utilize you correctly. Um, these easy to use devices reduce your exposure to harmful allergies and bacteria. Get an air purifier in your home. That'll help. You don't want to eliminate all exposure to stuff because you have to go in the real world and you don't want your body to be ultra sensitive. But in your home, get a, 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 an air filter, an air purifier, an ionizer. You want it every once in a while. It's not going to hurt. And they're not usually too expensive. Okay? Rest, everybody knows who this person is. Three hours. Now, this is one, and I struggle with this one because I feel like I have to do stuff, right? I gotta get stuff done. I can get done. I'm not done with this. I can't go to bed yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Three hours missed on a given night will cut the immune system effectiveness in half, excuse me. Just three hours missed per night. How many hours has anybody missed total this week? So far? Yeah. Far too many. Far too many. There you go. Um, well over three hours. Well over three hours. So <laughs> just, that already has, you know, that starts to diminish. And so I remember that. I have to, I have to read that many times. You know, you, the thing is you get caught up in stuff. And you know this like it's here, right? But it's not here and it's not part of our life yet. So we haven't had, when we have an experience with something, we have something to compare it to and say, mm-mm, I don't like that. I, I like this better. It's not just, it doesn't, it's not all only then something we know, it's something we have lived. And it's very different. Well, I've heard that the hours that you get before 12 o'clock at night are double the benefits for his skin and... Yes. Why is that? I don't know. Okay, I'll give you one reason. Um, I'm going to talk about melatonin. Something interesting about melatonin and sunshine as well. Melatonin, when we're outside during the day, that's why it's good to go outside and get the sunshine, um, and not just have lamps and stuff, is that light hits our eyes, affects the penile gland. The penile gland starts to store up melatonin, and it only comes to that process. So it stores it up, and then around the hours right before midnight, like 30-ish, 10 o'clock, the melatonin starts to be, it's like, because the body's saying, oh, it's supposed to be time to go to bed, so let's, it's time to let it out. So melatonin, along with things like tryptophan and serotonin, things like that, combine together, work together, and it starts to kind of help to calm us down, get those neurotransmitters all calmed down, and help us to fall asleep. And, in the, and if you're used to a habit as well, then that's what helps that melatonin to release at that certain time. And it's more aggressive at that time. It diminishes after the hour of midnight. Whether you're used to it or not, whether you have a schedule or not, it's going to happen. Okay. And, and it's so inhibited by light. Huh? The secretion of melatonin is, is, is inhibited by light. And after, it in us. after, yes. In the day, no, you need the light. After the hours, once you say hitting 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock, the light actually affects. Because as I said, the. What do they filter? Huh? What do they filter? Everything, all the, all the polluted air. All the things that we produce, because you have to remember, the minute I get up this morning, even while I was sleeping, once we start moving, our body is burning energy and producing toxicity. And so tonsils help with that, among other parts of the immune system. But what tonsils do is to help retain and then allow certain foods to get into our system. Isn't that like our first line of defense? Yes, one of our friends between that and our skin. Our skin also is one of our first lines of defense. That's why it's important to keep our skin healthy. So get some coconut oil. And then we take a shower and once in a while, just a nice little, you know, pamper yourself a little bit. Because your skin is your first line of defense. And have a little thing with a little spray bottle, a little eucalyptus, peppermint, anything that is an essential oil that, uh, that you can actually consume. And dilute a little bit and spread in your mouth every, especially during the winter months, you know. And and high therapy is something else that, that you know we would like to discuss even more. We won't be able to do it tonight though. Um, oregano oil, oregano capsules. Okay, I know for me it's one of the best things. Oregano. Okay. Um, but remember something about herbs. I think Bill was in that class the last time. Herbs when they say take two, that's not enough. Yeah, he said, yes, I have a double. You know what I love with my height and my size, which I'm 
working on my signs this way anyway. This year I have a goal to go back to what I was a few years ago. The oregano oil, I would take about eight in one shot. Because if I want it to be a response to a cold, I need to, remember, medication is potent. For You take a little pill like this, a little red pill, a little white pill, a little pink pill, and for it to then like take over your immune system, do you know how powerful it is? What it does to your body? And so herbs are not like that. They don't make them like that. And, most, and a lot of these medications are derivatives of herbs, a combination of herbs and a lot of synthetics, unfortunately. But oregano oil is one of the things I know for me, and that's the other thing, you have to experiment and see what works for you, okay? So you have to take some of these things in a higher dosage. And the other thing I will say, please always remember, that when you're going to take something, like I said, you can call us.